Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you were here with me doing this webinar live, you will notice that our recording today is a little bit different. We had some technical difficulties while I was doing the recording and uh, I've had to re-record. So if you, if it sounds a little different, if you're reviewing it, then uh, just that is the reason. And if you're joining us for the first time and listening to this, then welcome and you hopefully will take a lot away from this session. So as I mentioned uh, yesterday when I presented it, this webinar topic, I think, is an interesting uh, one that I wanted to address, mostly because um, the idea that ergonomics and disability management work together is, for me, a really important piece of the process. So often, we do a pretty good job of maybe investigating an accident or um, reviewing an injury that's happened, but there's not always a, a connection between how we can take the information we gather during that process and use that to springboard into making ergonomic change and making ergonomic change that will benefit everyone and hopefully prevent a recurrence of that injury. So we can use the data we're gathering perhaps in a more effective ways. And that's sort of the goal or the, the goal or purpose of the discussion today. So if you're not familiar with pro-ergonomics, let me introduce us briefly here. So I am Jennifer McGillis, and I'm the one on the left of your picture that you're looking at. And then we have Alex in the center and Sarah on the far right there. And we all take turns presenting webinars. So if you've been with us before, you've probably heard Alex or Sarah presenting, uh, or like hopefully had the luxury of hearing Alex or Sarah present. And our goal is always to help the clients that we work with ultimately reduce injury risk, which helps to improve workplace. You know, we do that by improving workplace design. And the, the benefits to the company in the end are that they injuries are expensive. We know that. And we're going to talk about that more today. And so if we can prevent those injuries, it's ultimately money back into that company's pocket so that they're spending money on the things that they should be spending money on, money on. being proactive and being engaged with the, the opportunities that you have presented that you know maybe you don't have the budget for right now. But if you were able to save ten or $20,000 in injury costs, if your injury costs are high, then maybe you know those things would be a reality for you. So that's sort of our goal or our purpose. So in order to achieve those uh, those benefits to the company, we provide a whole gamut of ergonomic consulting services. So we provide assistance with return to work assessments, which is kind of the connection here to today's conversation, which also can be, uh, we can also talk more about ergonomic risk assessments. So how we use the information we gather to determine what the risk level is and how we make change. We do that in the office as well as in an industrial plant floor in a hospital, wherever that may be. We can look at the hazards that are present and evaluate risk in all those environments. Uh, we've uh, conduct physical and cognitive demands assessments uh, and ergonomic training as well that varies from you know 45 minutes to an hour as a sort of a quick education session to multi-day for like your ergo team or your health and safety committee who may need a more in-depth session. So why do you want to work with us? Uh, probably the most important part is that we are, that the entire team at Pro Ergonomics are registered kinesiologists first and foremost, and then the three partners are certified professional ergonomists. So myself are registered with the BCPE, which is the American Board of Certified Ergonomists, and Sarah and Alex are both registered with the Canadian Board. And all that really means is that we have the education and the experience uh, and have, doc have had that evaluated by some peers to determine that we are uh, more than qualified be providing, you, be providing you with your ergonomic assessment services. So that's a, a pretty important one that we believe is actually pretty rare in, a, in a Canada to have three uh, individuals at a firm all have their certified ergonomist designation. We already talked about briefly about cost savings, right? We help you save money by reducing the likelihood of injury. We also typically uh, help with morale and other things, the workplace. If we come in and make a, you know, listen to your employees, help them uh, sort of communicate what their issues and challenges are and actually successfully move forward with improving their workstation. Typically that generates some, uh, some cost savings and some morale boosting. You always get a team approach with Pro. We uh, we always are working behind the scenes. Even if you're only ever going to meet one of us as your on-site consultant, you can always rest assured that the other uh, members of the team are working in the background. So we're bouncing ideas off one another. We're editing each other's reports so that we can a review it, and make sure that it's all accurate and there's no discrepancies, and also provide uh, detailed information that or suggestions or thoughts or you know poke at some of the recommendations each one of us is making. So you get a really comprehensive well thought out uh, report when you when you work with us. 
we customize everything that we do. So uh, we, you know, we look at all of your solutions and all your challenges. Every worksite is unique. There are obviously similarities here and there, but every worksite is unique. So we make sure that we consider that in all of our recommendations, all of our solutions, all of our trainings are customized. Nothing's, you know, sort of we start with a base and then we add, delete, uh, modify to meet your needs uh, to try and customize that so that it speaks really to your team members. And we can pr say that we're experts in your industry, whatever your industry may be. We have experience in everything from sort of just general administrative, government services, sort of office environments, to nuclear facilities, to food manufacturing, to automotive, uh, to hospitals, to municipalities, and the you know gas and oil industry, mining. The list is really quite endless. So I can with confidence say that you always will uh, work with an expert in your industry. So the goal for today is to cover a few things. I want to briefly talk about what uh, and injury statistics are for musculoskeletal disorders. Then I want to talk a little bit about what near miss and accident investigations and how we can use that information, uh, perhaps for more than what we're doing right now. So I want to talk about what that process looks like and how we can use it. Talk more about determining the root causes and most importantly, focusing on the ergonomic root causes for some of these injuries, uh, these musculoskeletal inju injuries. The process of adding ergonomics to your existing workplace investigation process. So we're talking about what happens after an injury occurs. So I want to talk about how we add ergonomics to that process and look at it as an opportunity for change. And then perhaps one of the most important things that we do, although it doesn't always seem like that, is we also have to be salespeople often, right? So we need to sell our recommendations, our solutions, or our change opportunities to upper management. And for some of you, that might be easy. You have a team that's really interested and sees the benefits of ergonomics and opportunities there um, and is on board with that, and you don't have to sell very hard. Uh, for others of you, ergonomics is going to be very low on the priority list for your upper management team. And so uh, that may mean that you have to be a better salesperson. So we'll talk a little bit about how you can make that happen. So I want to start with injury statistics. Uh, I'm going to highlight schedule one on this slide and schedule two on the next. And uh, the difference between the two is really just what uh, type of employer you are. Certain certain public sector employers uh, fit into the schedule two uh, category, which just measures things a little bit differently than schedule one employers. So the most recent statistical report from WSIB for Schedule 1 uh, indicates that we spend a ton of money on injuries, right? 25, just over $2,500 million is spent on injuries. And we uh, sort of the highlight for me out of the whole report and the last several, they've all been fairly consistent, uh, is that the leading cause of injury uh, consistently remains as sprains and strains. And for most of us, you can consider those to be ergonomic injuries. There, there, there will be odd sprains and strains that occurs in other ways. But generally speaking, a sprain or a strain is caused by overexertion. And they document that as the main cause of those injuries. So overexertion means wear and tear to our body over time time, which is exactly the description of an ergonomic injury. So when we're looking at these statistics, it's important to note that 40% of workplace injuries are still documented as sprains and strains. So this number is down a little bit from previous years, but it's still by far the biggest uh, incidence uh, or most frequent type of injury that occurs in a workplace. This is also true for schedule two, also true, excuse me, for schedule two employers. So the the cost on injuries is different because the way that it's uh, determined is different for these industries. But their leading cause of sprain uh, of injuries for this group is also sprains and strains, and the leading cause of that is also overexertion. So same rules apply here as on the previous slide, except the the statistics are even higher. Forty seven percent of injuries in Schedule Two employers are sprains and strains or ergonomic related injuries. And the, va the, mo the majority of those or the most frequent cause of those is overexertion. So that is a those are pretty significant numbers. And one of the reasons I think that we sometimes have a challenge in uh, sort of translating this to our upper management team is, yes, our ergonomic real injuries or our sprains and strains are the most common type of injury at our work site, but they, obvious, they often are not the most serious. So your ergonomic injury is not likely to kill you. It might, it's possible, it's happened, but it's not likely to kill someone. 
right? Whereas a slip trip fall or a fall from heights is way more likely to be a fatality or a critical injury. And so uh, oftentimes, even though sprains and strains or ergonomic injuries are our most frequent type of injury, because they are not as uh, severe in their consequences, they often get pushed to the back burner. But the most interesting part is that if you're talking dollars and cents, we actually have an opportunity here to have a huge positive impact financially. If, if you're experiencing a lot of sprains and strains, then ergonomic change uh, has an opportunity to save a lot of money at your workplace. Because if you can prevent even a handful of those injuries from occurring, then you're putting money back in your pocket, which is a great opportunity here. So some of the barriers or the challenges to reducing MSD injuries is that it can be difficult to get buy-in from upper management. They don't always see the value, partly because the severity of the injury perhaps isn't as uh, isn't as high or high risk as some of the other activities that you're doing at your workplace. Like, you know, an arc, you know, electrician working with electrical products, there's more risk of an arc flash or something else happening that has very severe consequences. Um, so that, that high frequency but low severity factor is a, is a big one. Um, one of the challenges we often hear uh, folks quote some of our clients are talking about is that when it's hard to build a business case for these types of injuries uh, because you say you want to buy a new lift assist, the you know price tag it says it, I'm just picking a number out of the air, but the price tag is fifteen thousand dollars. You want to install this new lift assist, and the upper management says, okay, well, how many injuries are we going to prevent? How do we how do we build this business case and one of the biggest challenges is that we are often preventing a potential injury. So we're guessing at how much this injury, how, what the likelihood is it might occur, and then how much it might cost us can all be a guessing game. So it can be hard to get concrete data or concrete numbers on these types of injuries, which is definitely a challenge. Uh, sometimes we have some strange perceptions. Um, for example, you may have an, a work area where there is one small female who's been doing this job for a long period of time and she has not gotten an injury. We know the job is difficult, but she's been able to do it for years and years with no injury. Then you put a new, uh, a new employee in there, a large male, and six or eight months later, he's coming in and reporting an injury. And uh, upper management in particular doesn't always make the connection that everybody is unique and everybody's body is different and how my body will respond to an to a, a stress that I place on it versus someone else standing right beside me with the same stressor is very different. So sometimes the perception is that this person is faking it or that they, you know, aren't as injured as they should, you know, as they claim or that, it, you know, it's, it's something that's happened outside of work and they're just trying to make it a workplace injury. Those perceptions are there, especially when the, the perception is that the employee looks like they're able to do the job. So if you, you know, have a large male doing a lifting task that it happens to be particularly fit, they look like they should be able to do that job. But the reality is that perhaps they can't. Perhaps there's something else about their body that limits their ability to do that. There also may be a perceived, uh, a perceived, uh, a perception that there's a high cost to making change in the workplace. And that can be true, right? I I'm not going to lie that there aren't times that I make a recommendation that you automate something or that you put a an expensive lift assist in or that you look at you know totally modifying the way this workstation is laid out which is a several thousand maybe multi thousand dollar project to make it all work and make it all happen so there's a perceived high cost of change but there is quite a bit of literature out there that actually suggests that ergonomic uh, change the return on investment is really short. So unlike some other types of change that you might make where it takes years to see the actually to see the return on that investment to really see the company actually making profit on that uh, is really quite low for ergonomics. It only takes six months to a year, sometimes even less than that, to typically start to see your return on investment. You really only in many cases have to present prevent, depending on how expensive it is, to prevent one injury, oftentimes you would save the money. So if you can look historically and say, We've had one injury on this job or this task every two or three months over the last five years. So if we implement this $15,000 lift assist, all of a sudden we are eliminating the need to lift, therefore significantly reducing our risk of injury. You only have to prevent one injury to pay for that lift assist. So if you don't have another injury for six months, you've prevented one, two, or maybe even three injuries that you know is, is ultimately has already paid for the, the the tool that you've implemented. So there is a perce perception, I think, that the cost of change can be really high, but uh, it isn't always the reality. The literature actually suggests that ergonomic change has a quick return on investment, typically. 
So if we're going to look at uh, injuries, the first step once an employee uh, gets an injury of some kind is to do your accident investigation. That's a, a pretty typical step, uh, ne next step or first step in the process for most companies. So I want to talk a bit about how we can use that step to make uh, more ergonomic opportunities uh, come out of that. So I want you to investigate uh, for both of these types of things. So I want you to investigate for an accident and an incident. So the difference between the two, I'm sure you're familiar already, but the difference between the two, if you're not, is that an accident refers to an unplanned event that interrupts the completion of an activity and may or may not, but typically does, include injury uh, to the employee or perhaps property damage. And an incident is same thing, unexpected event. It may, it did not cause injury, but it had the potential to do so. And we typically consider this an incident. Another term you might hear is a near miss, right? That it, something happened that was unexpected. There was high potential for an injury or perhaps property damage, but we, uh, we didn't actually have it occur. So we typically investigate both of these to try and figure out how we can prevent it because a near miss just means that it's likely to happen again if we don't do anything about it. Right. So we typically investigate both of these. And I would encourage you to do that with an ergonomic eye. And I want to talk about what that might look like. Every work site I've ever been to does a different uses a different method for the root cause analysis process. But I think just about everybody goes back and looks at the root causes, trying to identify the root cause. I want you when you go through, these are just some examples, I pulled them offline of different ways, uh, different diagrams or processes that you can use to uh, ultimately get to the root cause of a, a problem or an injury or a near miss. Um, and you're probably familiar with them, uh, or at least one of them and use one of them at your workplace, but a fishbone diagram, a tree diagram, very common processes. The one I'm going to pick out and talk about a little bit more, just as an, just to use as an example, not because it's particularly better or worse than any of the other ones, is we're going to use the root cause analysis process that's listed on the bottom left there, which is the 5Y process. So let's have a look at that one, and we'll sort of do a quick uh, case study to determine how we use that uh, information to get to the root cause and the right kind of root cause, and then how we use that to our advantage. So. So the five Y root cause analysis is used in the analyze, excuse me, analyze phase of the Six Sigma process or Six Sigma approach. So if you use that as part of your worksite process, then you're already likely familiar with this. But the goal is to continue to ask the why question uh, to get to the root cause. So you can keep, keep going with that why question. In most cases, you get there. The goal is to get there within five questions. You may actually get to the root cause before you hit five whys, and that's fine. And it may take more than five whys to get there. But the point is you just keep asking that why question until you get to the true root cause of the issue. What I want you to do when you're doing these, in particular, if you're thinking about make, using this for ergonomic opportunities, is I want you to avoid work method, myth, excuse me, work method issues as uh, your root cause unless it's truly the only option. So, for example, I see this often where you go through somebody's uh, accident investigation and one of their root causes they've identified is that the employee used poor lifting techniques when they were lifting and they got a back injury. Legitimately so, the employee may have used poor lifting techniques, right? I get that. It happens all the time, everywhere, right? But there could be a lot more going on here than just poor lifting techniques. The next question really needs to be, why did the employee use poor lifting techniques? Was it because they, uh, the product was at an awkward working height for them, so they had to reach down to the bottom of the skid to lift a box off rather than it being closer to their, el their uh, waist height or elbow height? Right? Or did, was it because the box was pushed away from their body? Was it because they couldn't walk around the skid to get close enough to actually lift something? There, there's a reason why your employee used poor technique. Right? We want to design, as, as is true with everything, we want to design it so that your employee pretty much can't use poor technique. Right? We want to give them every tool and education strategy possible to make them lift in, or do anything in the best posture possible. And so. In my example, if the employee lifted from the bottom of the skid, we need to evaluate why do they have to, right? And try and make it so that they don't have to. So we need to go keep asking those why questions. Why do they use per lifting? And there's lots of reasons why. And it might, I mean, every situation is different, but that's the example that I'm going to use that the skid is not height adjustable. It stays at floor height. The employee couldn't get their, you know, a feet around it. It's tight space. So it's kind of tucked in. 
skin, they had sort of an awkward process to access that, that box on the bottom layer of the skin. So here's just a quick example of how this might work or the kind of whys you might ask. So an employee hurt their back lifting the bag of product, I, I, slightly different than my example, a bag of product that's 55 pounds. Let's say they're working at a food company and they're lifting a 55 pound flour or sugar bag, okay? From the bottom level of a skid to load to a hopper, which then feeds the line. So the, the, the first why might be, why did the employee lift the 55 pound bag from the floor on their own? So maybe you have a policy in place that says they shouldn't lift more than 40 pounds on their own. Why did they lift more than 55 pounds? The root cause probably isn't that they should have gotten a second person to lift the bag, right? There's probably a reason. What is the reason why they didn't get the second person to lift the bag? So that's ultimately the question. So if they, you know, you that could be one of your whys. Why did they lift it uh, on their own? Because there wasn't a second person available. Why wasn't there a second person available? Because there was short staff that day and there was nobody in the immediate vicinity. Why didn't they wait for another person or call another person over? Because the hopper was empty and production was sh had shut down and they needed to hustle to get it back up and running and didn't have time to wait. And why, why, why? And you keep going through those things. We could also take the direction of why was the skid placed on the floor? So why was the skid placed on the floor? Well, because there's limited space in this area and blah, blah, blah. So then you could ask the next question about why, um, is there, uh, why isn't there a lift assist available or something to raise the height of that skid? And you can sort of keep working down the list. But you can see some other examples of what why questions you could start with or be part of your process to ultimately get you to the root cause, which in this example is probably has more to do with the, the fact that the employee even has to lift from the lowest level rather than, uh, rather than the actual work method that they're choosing to use when they do it. So after your accident investigation in the example I provided, after you ask all these fabulous why questions to get your because answers, you probably come down to, let's say you came down to these four responses. The root causes in this case were that the bag was heavy, so it's 55 pounds. They had to reach down to floor level to pick it up, so it's an awkward working height. The employee was reaching across the skid, so most skids are 40 by 40 or some variation of that. Uh, so they had to reach across the skid at least 20 inches in front of their body to grab that bag at floor level. It was 55 pounds and scheduling issues did not allow for anyone there to help them uh, make that lift. And there's, you could even add to that, that there's no room around the skid to, act, to get closer to the bag. Right. So these are the, the, the root causes that you've identified in this example. So now we need to, to use this information to start to move forwards with ergonomic change. And that's, you know, that's really the point of today's conversation is that you've had this injury. Why stop at just doing the accident investigation and educating that employee or or training that employee or making a minor change here to try and make it better or making no change, right? This is a great opportunity to use this injury uh, as a motivating tool for your upper management to make change here. It, it can really can be a great motivator. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes an injury has to occur before we get the motivation or get the buy-in, but if that's the only way that you can do it, then at least use this as your opportunity. Still focus on those proactive things because that's that's the ideal, right? I, I guess I should, I should have started this whole conversation with that, that being proactive is always the way to go. But if we can't be proactive, then at the very minimum, use these reactive things to your advantage. So ultimately you turn them into a proactive approach to prevent injury for other people in the future. So now that we've got all of our root causes, we want to start adding the ergonomic components. So now we've determined what the root causes are outside of work method things, right? Focus on the actual layout of the workstation, the weights, the reaches, the products, the tools, etc. Now we want to move forwards with looking at how do we evaluate this and ultimately make change. So I've pulled up a brief uh, risk assessment diagram here, sort of a process diagram, and I wanted to highlight what stages we can use different elements at. So when we're identifying the root causes, we're really uh, determining what the, the hazards are. And in my example, they're manual material handling hazards, right? But we want to identify what the root causes are. So uh, we already did that, right? We've identified ultimately the hazards. In this example, it was weight, it was height, it was reaches, 
right? And so all of those things were your root causes and those are the hazards present at your job. Now we want to move on to add the ergonomic element and really make a good business case here to make change is we want to evaluate that hazard just like we would in any change process. You identify the hazard. Now you need to determine what the risk level is. So you need to evaluate that hazard. So that's essentially where an ergonomic assessment is going to come into play. You take the weight, the height, the reach of this of this that caused this injury, and you are going to run that by uh, in some guidelines and determine whether 55 pound bags are within the guideline. If they're not, then that is going to give you some really good ammunition because this this process or this the way that you this job is done caused an injury. And I can demonstrate through ergonomic risk assessments that it's likely to cause another injury because it's high risk. And so that's essentially what high risk means is that it's above a guideline. It's likely to cause an injury. So we can we can pretty clearly say that it already caused an injury. This is how much this injury cost and it's likely to cause another one. So I want to implement a change here to prevent that from happening. So ultimately, we're going to evaluate that risk using a risk assessment. And then we're going to move on and start to control the hazard, which is ultimately the risk reduction process of the piece of the process. So some examples of our ergonomic assessments, you want to evaluate your root cause. How likely is it to cause another injury, which I already indicated. Uh, most times when we're comparing uh, information we gather from a job site to uh, standardized guidelines, we come up with, I can never say that a task has a 0% chance of injury because if you move in any way, uh, pretty much, I can't, you know, there's a chance that someone might get injured at that job, or however unlikely. But what I typically say, or what we typically say, is that it's sort of low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. So if you are below the guideline, then you're low risk. If you are at the guideline, then you are moderate risk, right? So you're still under it, but you're right there, like right at the very top. So that's considered moderate risk. And then if you exceed the guideline, you're considered high risk. And that's essentially what we're evaluating here is how likely is it to cause another injury, low, moderate, or high risk. As we move up in the process, the risk obviously increases. So we're going to compare those findings to standardized guidelines and determine our injury risk level because this is our opportunity, right? We've had the injury already. Let's use that to springboard change. We need to know how risky this behavior is and then make our business case from there. So if your injury risk is high, then that is what I would what I called in the the webinar yesterday, I called the catalyst for change that a great way to get buy in is to say, look, this injury happened. Here's the likelihood it's going to happen again. And we want to prevent that from happening because this is how much it costs us when it happens. So I have a recommendation. It's only $5,000. This first injury cost us 15. And so we want to stop that from happening again. I don't think anybody would argue with you if you're saying injury to happen again may cost us upwards of 15 grand. And my recommendation for change or my solution here is five. There, you know, that's a pretty simple math that it basically we're putting $10,000 or more back in our pocket after the very first injury uh, or re-injury might occur, which is, is a cool opportunity. So some examples of recommendations for change. We, we, typically, we divide our recommendations up into two formats. We look at engineering controls first and then administrative controls. So in my example that I provided, we'd be looking at height adjustable pallet stands. So something that actually raises and lowers to create height adjustability. So your employee doesn't have to bend down to their below their knee level to grab that bag. If you have the space for it, something that spins around in a circle is nice because it allows you to always pack or unpack from the closest edge of the skid, which is a nice feature, but it takes a bit more space to make that happen, right? If we can align it with the level of the hopper so they don't have to walk anywhere, uh, they can just kind of slide it off of the skid onto the hopper and cut it open. That eliminates the weight that they actually support. So there's lots of opportunities here. And basically all of those I just listed gives your employee or eliminates the, the likelihood or minimizes the likelihood, I guess I should say, that the employee is going to lift poorly because if you, you basically are making it easier for them. So most people work as easily as they can. Uh, and it, if you can make it, set it up so that it's easy for them, they're likely to do it, right? So something that they don't necessarily even have to adjust on their own. A lot of pallet stands are like weight sensitive. So as you lift weight off of it, they actually raise on their own. And so that might be a good a good option here so that your employee doesn't even have to manually adjust the height of those at, a, at any point. They don't have to press a button. It just kind of does it on, it on its own. 
right? So the goal here is to create some engineering controls that make it way less likely that the employee, even, even if they wanted to use poor lifting techniques, it's really illogical because I have it at, you know, I have it at elbow height approximately or slightly below elbow height. It's in line with the hopper. There would be absolutely no reason to use poor lifting techniques here. In fact, it would kind of almost be hard in order to do that. Like you'd have to really go out of your way to be poor uh, in this example. Administrative controls can be good too. Uh, they're just things uh, more like trainings or scheduling changes. So for example, a job rotation, so somebody doesn't have to access this job as frequently to reduce risk potentially. Uh, teaching someone you know, poor lifting techniques, you could retrain them on safe lifting. Uh, stretching or warm up programs, we've seen some more requests for those just lately. So there's lots of administrative controls that are options here as well. Uh, but just like every other control we implement at our work site, we wanna start with our engineering controls and then move on to administrative controls. So I kind of highlighted some of this already, but just a reminder to build as we build a business case, uh, a business case for ergonomics, I said it already can be challenging, but it's much easier after you've had an injury, which again is not the ideal. We don't want to injure someone in order to effectively make change. But if you're having trouble building this case on your own, this might be a good opportunity to take advantage of. So you look at the cost of the injury and the likelihood of injury recurrence. So whether it's high, medium or low risk, right? You run your risk assessment here. If it's highly likely to occur again and cost you X amount of dollars the first time, then you can estimate that if I make a change, this is how much money I'm going to save per, if you have some historical data, that frequency is a huge factor, right? If you know you typically have three to four injuries on this job per year, then you can look at that and say, okay, historically, this is what it's cost us. It's likely to happen again, and this is a, approximately the kind of dollars that we're looking for. Then we can move on and do the, the positive opportunity. We want to determine what our uh, our suggestion is for change. How are we going to improve this job? So what's the cost of that change? So if you want to implement a lift assist or a pallet stand or whatever that may be, do your research, find out how much it's going to cost. And if you have to pay to have someone like myself come in and do the risk assessment piece, because that's not something you're able to do, then we can help you with that. And you factor all of those costs into your cost of change. And obviously, if the cost of the change is less than the the cost of the injury to have a re-injury, that's the no-brainer, right? If it's going to cost me less money than it would be to have a second injury, and it's very likely that I'm going to have a second injury, then why wouldn't we be able to sell that, right? Upper management likes typically likes dollars and cents. That is a language that they speak and they have to focus on. Uh, so it's nice when we can bring those dollars and cents to them uh, in some more concrete ways, right? So build the bills, the business case can be a really important strategy. So just looking at sort of the process overall, that if we want to use the an injury to springboard change here, we obviously have to start with an injury, which is not the ideal, but if that's what happens, then that is what happens. You have an injury or a near miss of some kind, and you do your accident investigation, and you determine what the root causes are. And if you can determine what your ergonomic causes are, right, the hazards essentially is what you determine here, identify as the hazards, then you can take all that information and evaluate that root cause, which is the risk assessment, right? So you're going to run your risk assessment, determine how likely it is for that injury to occur, and then build your business case. And if you can do that, then you likely are most likely to get your buy-in uh, to actually successfully make change, right? And sometimes it'll be a, you want to make a capital investment of some kind, like the only way to make this process better is to implement some kind of conveyor-based system, which is several thousand dollars, several thousands of dollars, and it's not something that can happen right now. You want to go prepared to your upper management team with a couple solutions in those cases, right? If your if your ideal recommendation is going to cost you a thousand dollars, then that's probably you just take that straight to your upper management team. If your ideal solution is going to cost you five hundred thousand dollars, then you probably want to go armed with some other temporary solutions, knowing that five hundred thousand isn't just sitting around, right? So that's going to be a capital investment, a long term project, but you still want to build your business case for it. Why do we want to ultimately make this change? Why is it important? Um, but just go armed with some other smaller ticket items that might be able to happen right now, right? which is kind of a, the, a good strategy to always take in these processes. 
Okay, so that's all I want to cover today in terms of using an injury to ultimately make your case to make change at your workplace and how to sell that to your upper management team to help you get there. Uh, I just don't always think that we use the injury information to our advantage fully, especially because sometimes those departments are siloed. What health and safety is doing and HR and disability management, they may not be directly connected. Uh, they may not even be under the same management team. So you may be in a totally different department. And so it's not always the first thing that we think of, right? As an injury occurs, our disability management team takes over, but somebody else entirely might, might, right, might run the uh, root cause analysis process and accident investigation process. And so if that's the case, then we need to make sure that we're connecting those two pieces together, actually getting to the root cause and ultimately making positive change. So if you ever have any questions about any of our webinars, this one or otherwise, you can always reach out to us at that email account there. Uh, that goes to all the partners at the business and we, whoever is available and in the office will respond as quickly as possible. And you can always call us on our main line, which is uh, available there as well. And we'll get back. To, if we're not in the office at the time, uh, then we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Just a reminder that our next webinar is upcoming on December the 9th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and it is on five ergonomic strategies to improve manual handling tasks, which is if, if the case study I provided today uh, it was of interest to you, then you may find that this webinar uh, is something that's very relevant to, to improving your work site and your, your strategies for manual material handling. So uh, without, without further ado, because I am doing this uh, after the fact, I don't have any of the questions that were asked uh, in the webinar, and I do apologize for that. But if you do have any other questions, like I said, please reach out to us, and I'm happy to uh, get back to you. Thanks so much for uh, listening in, and we hope you have a great day.